in a moment. Um, so if we think about the selection rules, a molecule must contain a permanent electric dipole moment to give rise to a pure rotational spectrum because that is going to give it a moment of inertia, right? Um, and also if we think about the selection rules with our photons, we know a photon has S equal to one, which is root two H bar angular momentum, okay? Um, so if suppose this is the J equals one level and this is the J equals two level, we know going from a difference of one to two is also going to give me root two H bar, right? It's gonna be J times J plus one root H bar for the angular momentum, okay? So that means this molecule going from J1 to J2 will have absorbed root two H bar angular momentum. Um, if the molecule relaxes from an excited state to a ground state, it will lose root two H bar momentum, which is exactly the angular momentum of a photon. And so that means that it can emit a microwave fo photon going from two to one, or it can absorb a microwave photon going two to one. And because that root two angular momentum is conserved, all delta J values have to be plus minus one, okay? Um, I'm not gonna discuss these um, with too much detail, but we note here the delta K being equal to zero. That means we are staying within the same electronic level. So if we were in our ground electronic state, the microwave energy is not going to pump it up to another electronic ground state. And that just kind of makes good sense because of the energy requirement to do that, okay? Um, and then also our delta mj has got to be zero or plus minus one. And this is also due to our um, angular momentum that must be conserved, okay? So moving on. So here is a good example. So this is um, carbon monoxide. And now specifically, you notice that this is carbon 12 O16 because the isotopes in rotational as well as vibrational spectroscopy are really important, right? Because if the rotational spectroscopy is all about the moment of inertia, then the masses of those isotopes are critically important. So a rotational spectra, as well as a vibrational spectra, is a good diagnostic tool to probe isotopes and the isotope effect, uh, which is really cool. Okay, so now let's um, chew the spectrum apart. So um, here I was kind of, I was showing you how I put that together before, how each of these levels grow um, by 2B at a time, right? 2B, 4B, 6B, 8B. 10b, 12b, etc. So then now the difference between each one of those is two times b, okay? So delta ej equals two times j prime times b, where j prime is the upper level. So for example, when j is equal to zero, this whole thing is equal to zero. But when j is equal to one, two times one, right, gives me that value, okay? All right, very good. So um, here we can see this nice, lovely rotational level spectrum. Um, and you notice here that it has this lovely Boltzmann distribution, okay? And it has a Boltzmann distribution because each of those states at 40 Kelvin are populated. So we're going to see a zero to one transition. We're gonna see a one to two transition, a two to three, a three to four, and so on and so forth. And you notice for this sample after about, um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So the nine to 10 is showing us that that's the least intense transition. And so that's because at 40 Kelvin, the carbon monoxide is not going to have a population above that line, okay? 
Um, and so what I also want to point out now is if we start looking at the actual frequencies, so we can look at this in terms of wavelength um, or frequency, right? So here this is given as frequency in megahertz, um, and that's microwave radiation. Okay, so these are microwaves. Um, and now you notice that they are going up by this even amount. And if you look at the spacing, it's approximately 115,000 megahertz. So if it's, if it's supposed to be one of these spacings every two times B, right, let's note that, two times B, um, then why are they not exactly two times B each time, right? What is going on there, okay? Well, as it turns out, when this sample rotates, it experiences what we call centripetal distortion. So those bonds are, in fact, not rigid. Okay, and so as this molecule is being spun around, those bonds are being elongated. That has the effect of changing its moment of inertia and, of course, also its angular momentum. And that effect becomes even more pronounced at higher J levels. Okay. So this, um, these first few levels, especially like this very first one from 1 to 2 at 115, 266, or even the 0 to 1, 115, 271, those are likely the true value um, of B, okay? So I'll point to this ground state 1. Um, because, again, at that small rotational level, at the ground state rotational level, there's not a whole lot of centripetal distortion going on, all right? Um, and so, as it turns out, that, that centripetal distortion effect can be given by the J constants as well as the distortion constant, okay? So that's given by D, all right? So that's the distortion constant. And so you notice the effect of this is that it reduces the energy level because as the bond is being elongated, you have to kind of think of um, what I like to call the quantized ice skater, right? So imagine an ice skater spinning round and round and round. As you bring your hands in, you rotate faster. And as you bring your hands out, you rotate slower, okay? So as it's being distorted, as those bonds are being distorted out, it's going to slow down its rotation. And the effect of that is it reduces... Uh, the apparent energy spacing. It doesn't change the rotational constant, but you can see because there's a subtraction there, it's going to reduce the spacing between energy levels. And as we go down this series, you can see each time those levels are decreasing um, by, it's, it's a fairly constant amount. It seems like it's a constant amount, but it is based on this J squared. Okay. Um, and so the other thing I'll point out, the distortion constant is also dependent on the vibrational energy, okay? So we're going to talk about that soon as well, um, but that's what that constant gives us, okay? Um, so I got to see what I have next. Okay, so um, the next thing that I want to do, so I've been talking about 30 minutes, so I'm going to cut it off now, but um, what I want to get into next, still getting into this um, uh, rotational spectra, um, I want to really, really get into this in nice detail because this is cool. Um, the rotational lines are actually a molecular thermometer. So we can actually use a rotational spectrum as a thermometer, which is really cool. And I will describe that in more detail in the next video.